Amen. Hebrews 11 and 7 and then Luke 12 and 26 and then uh, we'll go before the Lord. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. You realize as you prepare yourself for the coming of the Lord, you condemn the world. It is important that you put a real large line of demarcation between you and the world. It says don't even have fellowship with that mess. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Prepared an ark to the same as house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Righteousness comes by faith. You got to do things by faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, some of you think, oh, man, I got the long sleeves and the cut or the uncut hair. That's all there is to it. Man, you ain't been walking by faith. Uh-huh, renew that faith. Luke 17 and 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus, we love you. We need you. Open our hearts, enlighten our minds, help our spirits receive what you are saying to your church tonight, today, in these last days, God, help us to be awake and aware, God. Help us to be diligent about what we should be doing, God. We thank you for the warning. We thank you that the word of God has moved upon us. Your presence has moved in us and that we can walk with you daily. Everybody say in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. It's really hard to try to grasp what Noah was going through trying to tell people that it was going to rain. And so I think the magnificent side of God was you're going to preach to them that it's going to rain, but you're going to build an ark. The preaching may not always get your attention, but the activities of Noah definitely did. You see, you're going to be busy about something. And I believe God wanted to show the line of demarcation between what Noah was doing and what the world was doing. We know the world was after anything and everything the world had to offer. But here was this man and his family building an ark. Here was the people of God building something that that's not doing me any good today. I don't need it. You, you hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Amen. Can I get an amen? Genesis 6 and 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I think one of the hard things is to try to realize that even something good can be evil if it keeps you from being saved. It's not wrong having a fishing boat and going fishing, but if if you're out fishing every Sunday and you're never in church, there's a day coming when you're going to find out that fishing boat was evil to you. Does that make sense? Acts 28, Acts 2, verse 38 through 40. You, you know this, but there's just something about me. I want to make sure I read the plan of salvation as much as possible. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's this next part that I want to read to tie together where I'm going tonight. And with many other words, he testified in his words, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. They're so busy about doing everything but what God wants. And because they did not receive Noah's warning that it's going to rain, they saw no purpose in helping with the ark. We talk about the coming of the Lord, but if nobody 
takes it serious, who's going to bother with making the church a priority? The struggle against the enemy of your soul. We blame the devil. We blame the world. But can I tell you, our flesh and our will oftentimes is an enemy. John 10.10 10 is the contest in a paragraph. The battle for the souls of humanity. The thief come and mock not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. We are instructed to understand and be aware of how our enemy works against us. He uses us against us. And, well, can I say, we can blame humanity for a lot of trials and tribulations and struggles we have today because Man, if we just didn't create such an amazing set of circumstances to where we have all these things that distract our teenagers, that distract our young adults, the race, the rat race, as it were, for people to achieve what is called the American dream is we set up, we, we've set ourselves up. The Bible actually uses the word uh, inventions. We how many have been caught up in the adventures of humanity? I mean, that it covers everything. Anything that's got your attention, anything that gets your affection, anything that gets your time and effort that pulls you away from what's important. It's a, it doesn't make sense. So why, why do I want to be at church on a Wednesday night? Why, why do I want to uh, run and, and, and get involved in the things of the church? It doesn't help me right now. And so we have a battle, we have a warfare, and I, and, and I tell you what, I, I love Sunday night. Every Sunday night, we need to have a service like that. But every, every Sunday night deserves a Wednesday night like this, where we understand why we worship and dance like that, and why we have a service like that, because you get so caught up in the inventions of the things of this world that what happens Sunday night becomes foreign and unimportant. So we are warned about the enemy, but we're also instructed. First Peter tells us in chapter 5, verse 8, be sober. That, 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 that's more than just not drinking. Be level-headed. Oh, you work all day, man, and ah, oh, you got this going on. Man, it, don't, man, it makes sense not to be here for a Wednesday night or a Sunday. It'll just be Sunday morning, Christian. Right? Well, you don't believe me? Look around. This place is normally half full. Don't, don't, don't think that the things of this world aren't pulling on people. It's a real thing, folks. And I, I'm not saying anybody is going to hell there. But after the test is taken, we'll be able to go, well, that was a problem then, wasn't it? But then it's too late. Be sober. Be vigilant. Vigilant means to be awake. It means to be alert. Can I be real? We get tired and weary of that because, man, everything can't be that bad. Well, I guess it all depends on the results after the test. Shucks. Right? But it says to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, it's what we do, what we make important. It's whether we're sober and vigilant. The enemy's like, I can get them. Oh, he's caught up in this, or she's caught up in that, or Oh, you know, they got a little upset. Someone didn't shake their hand. They're a little bitter towards your church. But you know, I'm not going to talk about the devil tonight. Now, he may come up a little bit. We know the wiles of the devil. We know what lust of the eyes, pride of life, and lust of the flesh. But it's also essential to know how God works. 
So with the help of the Lord, I want to talk about preparing for the miraculous. I want to talk about after. We need to learn God's tactics. We need to learn how God works so we don't miss his hand moving in our life. And sometimes we miss what it takes for God to move and we become, well, I guess God's not caring about me. You're not doing nothing for me. And we're so worried about knowing what the devil's doing and we don't know what God's doing. So in the New Testament, Paul instructs us to be aware of how our enemy works. But 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, to paraphrase it, one, one uh, translation, translation says, after all, we don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We are not oblivious to his sly ways. But yet, can anybody confess, yeah, I've been kind of, I've given a blind eye to the, to the devil because it's been more important about what I want than doing what God wants. See, see, the enemy doesn't get you to have to go be evil. He can just get you not doing what's right or what's righteous. There's a lot of busy people. How many have heard of that? Well, I, I'm a good person. He's not coming for the good. He's coming for the saved. And the saved, as in the day of Noah, were, were what? Working on the ark. Diligently. Faithfully perpetually. It hadn't rained a drop. Nothing that had, had prophesied had ever happened yet. But yet, what were they doing? Now listen, I'm going to give you a phrase here that's arresting. And, and you need to apply it. Saul was made king because the Lord chose him. Correct? But Saul ceased to be king because he chose himself. You hear what I'm saying? You see, when you seek for you, you miss what God sought for your life. John 4, 23 and 24, most of you should know, it should be highlighted in your Bible. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Wait a minute, what are you, what are you reading here? This is how God works. This is how God works. He's looking for worshipers. You, you, want to know, you want to know the key to being successful in things of God? Be a worshiper. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Not just like him, not just believe him, but worship. Man, Sunday night worship was awesome. I believe God was pleased, and I believe it sets us up for the miraculous. But we just can't do it once every five years. Worship leads to service because now you get an understanding. You get your eyes open. Wait a minute. This thing's a little bit bigger than what I've been making it. I kind of made it this about making sure I'm punching the clock like work. And I show up and I leave and I show up and I leave. But really, it's about what you do when you're here. It's God's will for us to serve him and to serve those around us first. A great portion of our personal victory comes from that understanding. Matthew 6 and 33 tells us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whoa, wait a minute. Can, can I put that in perspective? We argue about, well, is this right or that right? That's low thinking. The enemy wants you right there. He doesn't want you to go, well, what, what, what's righteous? What's righteous is I put all this junk down and I go pray or read my Bible or I'm faithful to the house of God. I make sure that I'm being sober and vigilant because that, I know how my enemy works. But it's more important that I know how God works. Because if any man will follow him, let him satisfy himself. It's hard to do that in America. It's hard to do that today, Jacob. Every young person in your age group is, is, is chasing a whole lot of things. And a lot of it has nothing to do with the church. That's why import, it's important us as leaders and parents and pillars, that's going to make sense here in a little bit, 
are setting the example. It's not about what's right. It's about what's righteous. It's not about what you can have, but what you should be doing. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Pride and neglect of God's ordinances is fatal, even today. There's a, there's a place in the Bible. How does a fool die? By neglecting what he knows. The rich man was doing everything that was right, but he lost his soul. What a fool. Well, there's not only New Testament fools, there's Old Testament. In 2 Samuel, there's a story. I'm not going to go into detail, but I want you to listen to what happened. It says, and the king lamented over Abner and said, died Abner as a fool died. Thy hands were not bound. Thy feet, nor thy feet put in fetters. As a man followed before wicked men, so fellest thou, and all the people wept again over him. Our, our hands may not be bound, but they may be too busy. Our feet may not be in fetters, but we're really not walking in faith because that denying faith isn't always fun. Abner had killed a person by the name of Asahel, and he had Joab that wanted to revenge him. And Abner had kept himself safe inside what was called a city of refuge back then. But as time passed, and I don't know, Abner became complacent or maybe uh, started making friends and now nah, I got maybe got so dis maybe he just been doing it for so long that he forgot the importance of what he was doing. And he was going through the motions. And so he stepped outside of the city of safety. He forgot himself. He neglected the truth. Abner was close to safety, but close isn't good enough. He wasn't safe. He was within reach of safety. He was within view of safety, but he allowed himself to drift outside the city. And being outside the city put him closer to an assassin's dagger and desire. He, 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 wasn't worried about God's will. He was after his own, doing what he thought. Satan's tactics have not changed. Remember, that close isn't good enough. You better stay in the church. In fact, don't just stay in the church. Get involved. That way, you're busy about the things that matter and not complacent and in getting involved wholeheartedly in things that don't. Abner, he died as a fool died. His hands weren't bound. His feet weren't in fetters. It's interesting because it says, and the people wept again over him. Will we weep over you? Will you drift out? Have you already? You're here faithfully on service times, but what's going on all the other times? Have you ignored Denying yourself? Have you ignored? Have you become complacent? Will your pride cause you to make a truce with an enemy? Even yourself. It gets hard to deny yourself. Come on now. How many start off that three-day fast and you're going great guns till lunchtime? <laughs> till that joker co-worker walks in from lunch with that leftover pizza. What? Then all of a sudden, well, next time. Well, next time I'll do it. Give me that piece. Now, how many times? Well, I'll get spiritual next time. And we never really take serious that we have an enemy seeking who he can devour. Are you hearing me? This is why I'm going to say where we don't like. You got to know your weaknesses. You have to know the schemes that the enemy continues to throw at you and cause you to stumble. But it's more important that we know what pleases God because if I'm seeking to please him, 
and not self. The devil can't even get me on what's right or what's good because I'm seeking righteousness. Staying in the church, staying involved in the church keeps us from dying like a fool. Can you imagine anybody within the sound of my voice on the internet or in this room today not making it because you got busy with something of the world? You literally right now could be coming up in, your, in all the notes that you're taking and all the things you're, you may have the answer to cancer. But I'll be honest, even if you got that and lost your soul, would it be worth it? How important is what you're really up to? You got an invention you're working on. You got this project. You got, and oh, how important our flesh makes us feel. How important our pride makes us feel when our neighbors see what we got or what we have. But is that really worth what it could cost potentially? We got to continue in God's ordinances. That's vital. We, in order to become victorious, we have to start taking serious the thing the world has already cast aside. What we do in living for God will not make sense for those that are worldly. Don't go to the world for answers. If you're struggling, you better get to God. I need to know what he has to say. I already know the enemy, but I need to hear what God has to say. If you're struggling spiritually, I dare say it'd probably be good to drop everything. Put everything aside. I don't care what it is. Well, it ain't wrong. We're not looking about what's wrong. Is it righteous? Is it righteousness? I've come to the conclusion that more than a fair share of us have focused so much on what our enemy is doing and know how he works that we have in turn failed to truly recognize or become familiar with how God works. And so we're constantly on defense. Right? In other words, oh, okay, I can't. Oh, and we're on defense. We're not doing because we're on defense. We need an offense. I need, yes, I need to stop doing some things, but I need to replace that with doing what pleases God. We need, we need to take territory back. Are you hearing me? Not just barely hold on. What you used to do when you were on fire, maybe you need to get back to that. Maybe we need to know and research again how God leads and how God rewards that fervency in the fire of the beginning of living for God. It didn't matter what he asked for, I'm all in. How many remembers that? And because we've kind of drifted and got a little big for our britches and pride steps in, we, we don't know. We're unfamiliar with the tactics or we've neglected God's ways. And so the result is we tend to ignore him, even fight him. We miss him, his word, his will, his way, and we, we, we resist him. And sometimes when we get hit with a message that talks about this, we start to feel like he's more of an enemy. Trying to take something from me. I'll never forget a little boy in the church named Edward. And he was just a little, little guy and we had done a candy rain, and I'm standing there. There's all this candy at my feet, so I just picked it all up, put it in a bag, and sat down at one of the tables where we're eating. And he was there, and he's kind of cute, and I, I handed him the bag. I looked, and I saw, I don't know, was it a little, one of those little mini Mr. Good bars or Hershey's dark or whatever. Like, oh, when I reached in to get it, he was like. I looked at that little joker in the eye, and I, I just kept him my eye. But I said to him, wow. It was mine a minute ago, and my generosity just gave it to you. But I saw a little thing that I wanted. How many of us are like that? How many of us? God just blessed you. And now you're like. 
That's just pastor. That's it. No, we don't. Don't be an Edward. You didn't realize after that, I was like, anytime I went to hand stuff out against us, yeah, let me find a grateful, let me find a grateful kid. Let me find that kid that runs up, oh, thank you, you know? I mean, I wasn't mean to him or nothing. I, just, I looked at him. Well, you don't think God looks at us after he's been so generous with us and now all of a sudden we're stingy, tight? Why is that? Ooh. Well, how many times we've done something for someone, they turn around and do the opposite of what we asked them to do, and we turn, well, I'm never going to give them something. It would be wise to learn again and remember again how God works so that we can cooperate and participate and walk anew with him. Amen? I talked about the word after in the beginning. Isaiah is addressing the captive nation of Israel. They're bound by the Babylonians, and they brought it on themselves because they forgot God. Isaiah 52 and 12, For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by, by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel, Israel will be your re reward. He repeats this in Isaiah 58 and 8, And then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. We know that God goes before us in battle, but he also follows behind us. He, he sees the trail behind us. He sees what we leave, the trail behind. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So he, be, he comes behind us in the battle. He sees what you leave behind. He, he sees what you've done and what you did. and He's got to walk through what you've done. What we do matters. It matters to God and his reward. A rear guard is a detachment of troops detailed to guard the rear of a moving column. The rear guard is generally used for security when we move forward. There's something about us it, it, that we got to live in such a way. You know what? i, I got to make sure that what I'm leaving behind me is protecting me. Sun Tzu, in The Art of War, he said, the art of war recognizes nine varieties of ground. Dispersive ground. Facile ground. I'm not going to go into all these, but I'm just going to show you there's nine. Contentious ground. Open ground. Ground of intersecting highways. Serious ground. Difficult ground. Hemmed in ground and desperate ground. He said, ground that is of great advantage to either side is contentious ground. <laughs> Can we contend for ground? How many of you would agree we are in contentious times? That makes the fact that God is your rear guard extremely important. It's this contentious stuff behind me. So when God chooses to use the tactics of coming behind us, we need to understand that it's necessary to prepare the way for the Lord. One of the quintessential examples of this tactic that God uses when Moses and Israel are on their way out of bondage and find themselves at the Red Sea. God has gone before them. He's forced Pharaoh to release them. However, now they just don't experience God ahead. There's a whole lot going on behind. It says, and Moses said unto people, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. See, they saw Pharaoh coming behind. Wait a minute, God, you delivered me out of that. Which conduct matters because the enemy's going to fight over this coming behind you. You see, in the Old Testament, they pushed sins and rolled them ahead. 
You stop rolling them ahead, pretty soon they're coming to get you. You hear what I'm saying? For the Egyptians whom you see in this day, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and shall hold, and you shall hold your peace. God opens up the path, the parting of the Red Sea, and then comes behind them, and because they've been obedient. Now, we know there's a little struggle. We know there's a murmuring and complaint. How many knows about the murmur? Do I, I don't need to go and read that. I want to expedite this tonight. How many know there's just some people? Pastor, what are you doing? There's always those folks that want to question pastor. There's always those folks that want to question leadership. There's always those, wait a minute, pal. Can you just back up? You just got delivered out of Egypt. We had a speed bump, and you're already ready to go back. Don't listen to those folks who talk about the good old days. They don't even live there anymore. <laughs> so let me say something that we need to hear and we need to know regarding God's tactics. God helped them realize he delivered them from Egypt by a miraculous way. He used plagues and pestilence. And he, he, he did so many things that, that, that finally the enemy said, can you imagine being so yielded to God that that thing that held you captive lets you go? How many of you in prayer times, oh God, if I could just get through this, if I could just get break away from this, I can't imagine what I could do for God. The problem is, do you still imagine after you get let go? God already did his thing. He's already got him out. Now it's our turn. Now it's Israel's turn. Too often we're saying we're waiting on God when he's waiting on us. I'm going to tell you something. One of the most indicting things you ever could say is, well, it's your move, God, and I'm waiting on you. Hello? For God to step in, they had to step forward. Mm. They had to leave Egypt behind. We want God to prepare, and we want to just keep going. And God saying, no, it's time for you to start doing. He's waiting for them to make preparation. He's waiting on us to have our faith and trust. Many talk about faith, but you don't step out and trust. Well, you give, but not in jeopardy. You give, but not to where it hurts. You put a little time around the church, but not at the sacrifice of anything. Oh, God has our back. But I ain't moving forward. And you're stuck. Anybody stuck? When's the last time you got real spiritual? We heard the voice of God. And you could walk over and lay hands on someone and you knew God was going to use you. Let me tell you how that happens. It's when you prepared yourself and God's coming in behind you to defend you. He's ordered your steps. See, he ordered their steps, but they had to prove it by stepping out in faith. We like to talk about Daniel was delivered from the lion's den. No, he wasn't. He went into the lion's den. He went through it. Hmm. He went through it. He wasn't delivered from it. Our prayers is, don't let me go through anything. You see, when you make it about you, you're not going to put yourself in jeopardy. A lot of times we say, I want to walk softly and humbly means I don't want to do anything that's going to get me in trouble. I don't want to do anything where my faith will get tested. I don't want to get up and say anything where I got to walk what I've been talking. Can we say, oh, me? You see, the three Hebrews were delivered out of the fiery furnace, not from it. 
You will never experience this tactic if you're not willing to step out in faith. If you're really not willing to stand up to what's going on in our world, if you're really not willing to be faithful, if you're really not to go, you know what? I'm going all in with God, and I'm going to do this no matter what it costs me. You'll never experience deliverance until you're willing to prepare. Prepare for the miraculous. You have no need for a rear guarding of God if you're not behind enemy lines. Oh, you didn't hear me. The lion's den was the enemy's territory until Daniel showed up. The fiery furnace was the enemy's realm until the three Hebrews were just walking around there. You thought you was going to have a human barbecue, but now we just got ourselves a glorified sauna. Some I mean, of you will never experience that because the self-preservation keeps you from trusting God and walking in faith. When's the last time you put yourself at risk for the kingdom of God? Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. The Israelites had taken new territory. When is the last time you took some territory back from the enemy? When was the last time you sacrificed to God? When was the last time you found yourself at a new spiritual level? When was the last time you said, man, I ain't never been here with God before? Some of us ought to go home and have a conversation with our spouse. And when was the last time we went to another level in ministry? When's the last time we went to another level in faith? It's funny how many, you know, I, I, you know, I expect an element of reverence and respect around here because I'm the pastor. But can I tell you something more important than how you see me? I want God to look at Sister Cole and I go, we're willing to take new territory. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Erica, Erica gets this put on her weekly. I make little comments. And the other day, I was walking through the house, and I saw the light on in the spare room. I'm like, man, because I'm an electricity miser. I go in there and open the door, fix it, and turn the light off, and there she is banging on the keys. You know what she's doing? Taking territory. Getting better at something for the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not trying to blow her horn or build her up, but I'm telling you, what's stopping you? What's stopping you? What, what would happen if the whole church decided I'm going to take more time? Your whole church goes forward when you go forward. The whole church goes, why are we always looking around for, don't look around for accolades. Look around for more territory. Look around for do something for God that ain't been done before. Look around for, to do, I want to be better this week than I was last week. And look out to what I'm going to try to do next week. You gotta ask yourself, are you a pillar or a problem? Are you ministry or misery? Are you adding or taking away? You gotta ask yourself, are you taking territory or are you stuck? Can we not move forward because you won't go? Go read your Bible about this stuff. It's funny. How many rejoice over new things? We desire new and improved stuff. I, you know what? I mean, I like my new fridge, but I like the new microwave. Man, I have to go in there check. Is that thing running? Silent. It's got silent mode, whisper mode. It's crazy. I love it. It works. I'm, I'm thankful for it. Don't get me wrong. We like better dwellings and better houses and better places to live and we like the new car smell. We like getting a new car that are problem free. We like, we like the new appliances and all that, but what about a new me? What about a new you? What about a new church? What about a what about the kingdom of God getting something new? What about turn around and getting some stuff in the world? What about the kingdom of God getting something new in you and I stepping up, being what we ain't never been before? When was the last time you were made new again? When, when was the last time? You stepped to a new level, or broke new ground, or stepped up to a greater anointing. See, because if you're constantly playing it safe, you're not going to see this tactic or need 
this tactic from God. You got to get in your spirit. For those 120 so, some odd years that Noah was building the ark, he never got vindicated. His vindication came after he builds the ark. Hmm. The leper was cleansed after he took the steps to dip. Jesus reached for Peter after he stepped out of the boat and into the storm. The last time some of us got so involved in the church or, 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 or were willing to step out of the safety of where you've always been under the dangerous storm, the, the bedridden man was healed after his friends tore the roof off. The multitude was fed after this boy stepped forward with his lunch. Wow. Everybody say after. I got to find the after in my life. I got to get to the after when I've done something that, oh, you know what? I ain't telling the whole church. It's between me and God. I want to see what God's going to do in the after of my life, after my lion's dinner, after my fiery furnace, or after my sacrifice, after I stepped out. Sad, there's so many folks that want to go back to slavery because they remember the leeks and the garlic or the ground food. You see, but God is he's waiting until after we prepare the way. Because of Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that's, we don't. We don't because it says, and that he is a warder of them that diligently seek him. When's the last time you stepped out in faith to seek him? That diligently means to investigate. It also means to crave. You young guys craving or investigating ministry. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to seek it with all your heart and mind. So I'm to, I'm to, even after you get here, you better do it because there's so many things that come on you. There's so many things that attack you. I laugh because it's, it's crazy. Nobody minds if their doctor is living well. Nobody minds if the insurance agent is living well. No, 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 nobody minds him pulling up in a nice car. No, 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 nobody minds the politician. But if a preacher, the sad thing, church is okay with a poor preacher. Well, just fine with a poor, poor church. I wonder what would happen after we went all in. I wonder what would happen to the church when we started realizing, you know what, all this other stuff I'm spending all my time and everything, it ain't going to amount to, in fact, it's more of an anchor than wind beneath my wings when it comes to this God thing. I better get diligent about this thing. So how do we, when we get to the answer, participate in this tactic? How do we prepare the way for God? How do we prepare the way to prepare the way for a blessing? We give. We purposely pursue, we, we seek, and we find ways purposely to do something extravagant for God. When's the last time you've done something extravagant for God? Been a minute. God, God told Noah to build an ark. Now, I've never put it like this, but when the Lord spoke to me to come here, it don't sound near as exciting as I think it would be for Noah when the Lord said, hey, man, hey, Noah, build me an ark. I'd have been like, whoa, that's pretty heavy. God spoke to me. Wow. Wow. He went on that. He went on that for 120 years. He, he, my God, just the fact that the Lord spoke to him. 
gave him some, well, ridiculous task. It ain't never rained before. What you need to have submarine on land for? <laughs> wow, God just spoke. Noah didn't just sit there. I told him, you know, it was, a, it was a joke. What kind of wood was the ark made out of? No, you got to say it louder. You know why it's called gopher wood? Noah, you go for the wood. I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> but it wasn't just to Noah. He got his whole family involved. They laid aside all other endeavors and all other entertainments and constantly and faithfully sacrificed and served and they built and they built and they built and they built and, they built and then after. Drip, drip. Drip, drip. Raindrops are falling on my head. Man, left and right, we're pumping up and down to get me inside that ark. And the Bible says God again stepped in. God shut the door. God shut the door. Then after he built, God shut the door. God never left him. He, 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 he did what he was told to do. He did it right. He did it well. He did it diligently. He stepped out in faith for 120 years. Anybody here going to give 120 years? What an example Noah is for today, for us today. The Noah shows us. This is as in the days of Noah, not just with the day. Noah's the example. We're looking at the world. We need to look at Noah. Noah shows us how to be focused, determined, and convinced because what Noah did, God, what God showed up after, God stepped in after. The reason we teach giving and tithing is not so that the church is blessed, is because tithing is the prescribed preparation needed to open a door for your blessing. Malachi 3 and 1, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall, here's what, prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, ye shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. There's a preparation involved here. Malachi 3.10 goes on to say, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there be meat in my house. And prove me now here with the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows. Of, what is he saying? You put it in and watch what I do after. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pour out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Wait a minute. Hold on. Anybody here got some room? No? I got room, God. Now, do you have, okay. Anybody here got some room? Wait a minute. It, Anybody could take a whole lot more. But hold on. Anybody here got more room for blessings? Anybody got room for some financial blessings? Anybody got room for some healing blessings? Anybody got, man, you just want to be blessed. I got some room for that. You know what? You talk about giving in. I, I had a history teacher, Mr. Duffy. Now, I'm not the smartest sharp tool in the drawer. But I didn't have to take my final exam in history because history, I loved history. I just enjoyed it. And he'd get mad because he'd be in the middle of making a statement. I'm, bam, I'd know. Bam, I'd know. You know what he told me? Look, don't even come to this classroom for the final. You just take that day off. I was prepared. You don't even need to be. You're so prepared, you don't need to show up for this one. Oh, I wonder if some of us got that way with God. Luke 6 reiterates what Malachi tells us. Given it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again. 
we're not just talking finances. What about spirituality? What about righteousness? It's to pave a way for forgiveness. We repent. Well, you missed it. To pave the way for forgiveness, we repent. To prepare the way for a miracle, we obey. To prepare the way for a promotion, we must be faithful in the small, because then we'll be given the much. To prepare for a breakthrough, even, I don't know, in our marriage, our lives, we get biblical counseling, we honor, we prefer, and we live according to the things of God because we want the blessings of the Lord maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Like education. Hey, young people, to get an A on your exam, prepare to take the test. We listen in class. Preparation precedes the victory. Ain't no one gonna walk out. I didn't even study. I didn't. You learned a lot. You learned it in class. You have to study if you didn't learn it in class. Some people don't have to study. Like me, I had to study. I was a nine brain. I needed to read it more three times to get it in my head. But to get the A, I had to prepare myself for the A. If you want the A, you just can't hope for an A. You step out, and I'm gonna get that A. Give, and it shall be given to you. In order to be able to drive, how many took the little booklet and read it? See, back in my day, I don't know if they teach, they still teach driver's ed today in school? You go through a little class, you prepare to take the written exam. When you're taking the written exam, what do you do next? And that, that dude next, he's got that chicken right there. <laughs> right? What are you doing that for? You passed the written. You passed the driving so that, wait a minute, you're reading about driving. You're actually driving, but you're doing it all so you have the license and liberty to drive. The preparation proceed. See, in other words, you have to prepare the way for the freedom. You prepare the way for that liberty. Mm. So in order to do that, we set boundaries. We, 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 we set guards. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. See, but the liberty is not for the flesh, not for the occasion of the flesh. He says, listen, for brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for the occasion of the flesh. How many have taken all that God's done for you so you could be blessed and worldly? How many of us, God does so much for us, and we go up? Let me tell you some things that God gives you. Hey, young ladies. You've been taught to drink. You know how to go to a job interview. You have no idea what church clothes and church mannerisms and conduct. These, these are unintended consequences. I, I think everybody should go to church. I mean, even if you're going to be lost and go to hell, that's still going to help you in life. Go, we know how to dress to go to an interview. You know how to shut your mouth, mouth and how to act in, in, in a job interview. You know how to treat people at a grocery store. You know how to, even if you're not fully living for God, it'll help your marriage. In fact, I'll say this, hey, fellas, you'd be out of your mind to marry outside the church. I, I'll tell you right now, I stay single before I mar be married to a worldly woman. You see what's going on out there? Girls, I don't care how cute he is if he ain't going to live for God, because you won't be cute enough for long enough. Guys today are told, it's okay. It's all right. It don't matter. It's just a little fling. It don't mean nothing, baby doll. It's all good. She didn't mean nothing to me. Y'all better stay in the church. I'm telling you, there are benefits in the church that are great, not better than salvation, but I'm thankful for the blessing and the benefits that come after I get in and stay in the church. You get messed up, church will help you get back on your feet. You have to think that. How many have come to church for help? You ought to stand on your feet and thank God right now. How many times has the church house blessed you, helped you? How many times you got after, after, after? I'm telling you, there ain't nothing better than living for God. There's a lot of benefits after. 
Let me fin let me let me finish this. God blessed you with abundance so that you would serve. For everything we need, there's a preparation. There is a responsibility to take on. Our, our issue is we want God to step in before we're willing to step up. We want God to step in before we step out. But understand the next step is yours. And until you're willing to take it, you won't see God coming after you. If you're not moving, he can't come after. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Isaiah 43, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. What? Prepare? Prepare. Yeah, there's a preparation. Make straight and desert the highway for our God. Wow. I'm going to read Malachi. The Lord will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. Matthew 3, 3 through 6, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Matthew 3 and 11, John is speaking, I did baptize you under, uh, uh, with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me, he's preparing the way. There's something about preparing the way for what's coming after. After his mighty night, whose shoes I'm not wearing, he shall baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. After, after, see what's happening? God inhabits prepared places. He inhabits the praises of his people. Hey, you don't just come in here and sit down. You better praise. You better work. He's there. He's coming. He's coming. Luke 24, 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued. What are you doing? Prepare the way. Prepare the way. Why do we come early for prayer? Prepare the way. Prepare the way. Why do we live godly so many lives? Prepare the way. Prepare the way. Prepare. Why? Because something's coming after. Something's coming after. Why? Why are you doing it? Something's coming. Something's coming. Something's coming. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They've been doing it. They've been doing it. Look what happens. And suddenly, oh, no, 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 that ain't a suddenly. They've been preparing for this for a long time. They prophesied about it. They prepared and prepared. And you ought to prepare yourself. Get ready for a miracle that comes after. You've been doing what you should be. They, you see obedience doing throughout. And when the band Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared under them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them life. The amazing and the miraculous happens in prepared places. How's your life? You see, from digging water ditches during a drought to giving your last meal to a prophet, from marching silently around a walled city to taking your only son up a mountain of sacrifice. We, we see the woven thread of preparation of God's people who prepared themselves for the amazing, the miraculous, the impossible. What, what are you doing to prepare for him? What? What are you doing for God to come after? No preparation means there's no habitation. The only thing behind us is exposure. There's no armor for the back because we're supposed to live in a way to where God's there. We are vulnerable if we don't prepare, if we're not sacrificing, if we're not giving, if we're not living in the things of God. Stop and think how it was for the great folks that stepped out and prepared for God to move. Anybody want to get sideways with Daniel after he walked out of the lion's den? I ain't messing with his prayer life. See, if you want to be known for worldly things, great. Daniel wasn't known for, who was known? Don't mess with his prayer life. Those three Hebrews had found a Newfound respect among people. Oh, I'm going to follow them. I'm going to do what they do, man. You see what? Mm. Can you imagine how all the folks thought about Noah when those first few raindrops hit their head? 
How about imagine the swagger Abraham had coming down that mountain of sacrifice with his son. He had a new found walk with God out. You know why the first century church grew so fast? They knew preparation and sacrifice was the way to walk in the power of God. Now listen, this don't make sense. Go back and read from go back and read from 238 all the way through 47. There's some things that well, I ain't doing that. I know you're not. But there's some that are. You want the power of God in your life? You really want that? And they continuing daily with one accord. God, know, God knows them that are his. And in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such to be saved. Mm. Hallelujah. Israel was surrounded. Ammon and Moab had stood up against them. You know what their weapon was? Worship. Worship. And they rose early in the morning, went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. There's a lot hinging on the word of God and the man of God in your life. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. In fact, why don't you all come right now? that they should praise the beauty of holiness. You know, what, you know what that's saying there? The beauty of being separated from the world. Being separate. There ought to be, I'm going to tell you something. If you, if you are more about worldly music than you are about church music, if you are more about being involved in that out there than involved in this, and let me tell you something. This is going to grate against your skin. It's going to grate against your flesh. You, you're not even going to like this. Your mind is going to be jumping back and forth, justifying every little thing in your life, and you're going to be miserable. And praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, stand. When they began to sing and wait a minute, the enemy's right there. They don't have a victory. They ain't won no fight. They haven't even fought. But it's coming. See, the problem with some of us, oh, I'd fight the devil if I could see him. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, they saw him, you'd go run, and in fact, you've been partners with him for so long, he ain't got to show up. He enticed you right at him, going all in with God for a few trinkets and toys. What? If that bothers you, you're probably hitting close to home than you realize. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon and Mount Seir, which come against Judah, and they were smitten. Wow. They worshiped. You see, it's a lifestyle. It's not about, I like the song or not. Mm. Sister Jess, you kind of made a few mistakes earlier, huh? So what? No greater than the mistakes of the people that sat there and didn't worship and sing. She made a few note issues or, well, maybe that was more of the speed. I, was, I couldn't keep up at first. But you think I'm kidding? Watch this. And behold, a woman that came, a woman of Canaan came out from the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievous and vexed with the devil. Someone that can't pray through, someone that can't, they're vexed. We don't want to say that. You're vexed. There's something that's got you. Or there's something that you got a hold of. My daughter's, she's vexed. But he answered her not a word.
And his disciples came in the song and said, send her away. For she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep, house of Israel. But she did something. And sadly, we don't even do in the apostolic church too often anymore. We come in here, we got all these, we live in America, man. I got a full bank account, I got a full belly, a full refrigerator, I got a, car, a couple of cars, I got, right? I'm blessed. I, I don't need to worship. She says something. She said, it's not me to take children's bread and cast it to the dogs. It doesn't do good to argue with Jesus. If his word says, you're a dog, you're a dog. If you ain't been right, you ain't been right. Why would we argue God about what's righteous and what's not? I think he kind of knows. I think his word's pretty clear. If we just had the humility, the real walking softly and humbly, not that fake stuff, just saying it but not doing it stuff. She's like, yeah, I'm a dog. But watch what she says. Truth, Lord. That's right, Nehemiah. Yet the dogs eat the crows which fall from their master's table. Wow. But I skipped something on purpose. She didn't just come and say, the Bible says, then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. No, she worshiped him. She worshipped him. She worshipped him. It didn't belong to her, but because she worshipped him, God will not deny worship even from a dog. He has said, Oh woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Why? She worshipped. And her daughter was made whole. So I wonder how many people in our lives right now could be made whole if we'd worship. Maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter, maybe if it's a wife, maybe it's a husband. Worship is preparing for the miraculous. Worship prepares for the, he can set ambushments against the things that have been hurting you and keeping you. Your healing is on the other side of worship. The blessing is on the other side of worship. When you worship, sacrifice and praise is easy. When you worship, activity and doing the work of God is easy. Because when I worship, my answer comes after. 